Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Somerville. As John Allen mentioned, um, Bonner Arnold Kaiser, his, when he was born, he was named Bonner Arnold, was my grandmother's first cousin. And I grew up not really knowing this story. And um, many years ago, about 20 years ago, my grandmother was telling a story one day, as she often did. And uh, somehow in passing, she said, oh, and then that was my cousin that was murdered. Yeah. And I thought, Can you what? Hear? Hang on just a second, Lauren. Sure. You want to use this? Is yeah, probably. It, it'll it'll okay. show up better on the... Yeah, start video. over. Cut. <laughs> no. Go. <laughs> Take two. Uh, my grandmother's first cousin was... Yeah, that's on. Work. It's not on. It's not on. My grandmother's first cousin was Bonner Arnold. And she mentioned him in passing. Uh, tangential to another story that she was telling entirely. Most people, when you hear, oh, that's my cousin that was murdered, would think that was the main story. Not with my grandmother. So, I was... Shocked. I'd never heard this before. I asked my father. He said, I have absolutely no idea what you were talking about. My grandmother was a not want to make things up or tell tall tales. And so, of course, I asked her about it. She said, oh, well, it was in all the murder mystery magazines at the time. And didn't say a whole lot more. She used to talk about her Aunt Rosina and often said that Aunt Rosina was extraordinarily glamorous. And she thought that... She wanted to be just like Aunt Rosina when she grew up. She remembered going into Aunt Rosina's kitchen where Aunt Rosina had a mirror. She thought that, my grandmother thought that was the height of luxury so she could fix her makeup before going out. She always <laughs> kept a, a powder puff in her frilly, fancy company apron and just seemed like a really neat lady, but she really didn't tell me any other stories about that. Move forward about 10 years. And for some reason, this story kind of popped back up into my front part of my brain, and I thought, you know, I, I want to check this out. And I found the story, They Died Like Dogs. I'm sure most of y'all have read that. Um, I, in the last couple of years, was able to track down a copy, an original copy of the 1957 magazine, um, from a, uh, a comic book collector up in Canada, of all places. And... It piqued my interest again. There's some great photographs, but as I went through, I realized a lot of what's written in this story is not true. It's embellished, it's factually incorrect, and I thought, you know what? I, I don't think this story has been told the way it should have been told. But I also have a little bit more of a connection to it, too. My grandfather passed away in 2001, and my family, my grandmother's side of the family, is from Lawrence County. She's an Arnold. And we had gone out to Stranger Cemetery. My grandfather was to be buried there. I got out of the car. A couple of my grandmother's cousins who hadn't seen me since I was four. I was in my 20s. I got out of the car and they said, she looks just like Bonner. And that's kind of stuck with me. And over the course of time, I really felt like I wanted to investigate this. I realized that this was a 16-year-old boy who never really got to have a life, who was murdered by someone who should have been one of the most close, the closest people in his life. This was a man who had adopted him, had changed his name to Kaiser, and then took advantage of that trust. He murdered this young man's mother, possibly murdered his grandparents, and then at the end of it, murdered him. And I thought, you know what? I do. I think I want to tell this story. I want, to, I want to investigate who these people were, what life was like at the time. But I also kind of wanted to see Pocahontas. So I really started this year working on this story. And I called up April Duff down at uh, the county clerk's office. And she helped me out a lot. And I called and was looking for a marriage certificate. And she said, well, what is the groom's name? And I said, John Kaiser. And she said, oh, him. <laughs> and I said, well, yes. And I said, I'm, I'm actually writing a book. And she was delightful. She really helped me out. I said, you know, are there any leads you think I should track down? She said, you must come to the ghost walk. And I said, well, when is that? She said, well, I'm not sure when it is this year. But let me ask around. She 
did exactly what she said she would. She sent me an email. She told me about Dr. Carroll's wonderful guest house, which I've stayed at a couple times now. She told me about the ghost walk. She told me about the play that was going on. And from there, I came up here about three weeks ago and met Linda Bolin and John Allen and all these wonderful people who've really helped me out over the course of this. And I've also fallen in love with Pocahontas, so I'm back. <laughs> I think you'll have a really special place here. And I think, I think the story is not so much just about a murder. I mean, that kind of happens everywhere, right? But these neat little small towns all over America, and many of them are dying, but some of them aren't. And some of them have really neat stories and interesting characters, and it's kind of an adventure getting to know the people there. But this is... This murder story is also about a community as well, because this was a man who was thought to be a pillar of the community. He was a deputy sheriff. He was a landowner. He owned the movie theater and would let little kids come who couldn't really afford it on Saturdays. Um, he seems like a great guy. He gave a, you know, he gave the stained glass window down at the Methodist church. And so it wasn't just violation of trust within the family itself. He violated the trust of a community. And that's a really hard thing for people to move past and move forward from because living in a community, part of it is allowing people into your life and vice versa. But you, in order to do that and to grow as a community, you have to have that trust. And he violated it. But this town obviously moves forward from a lot of stuff. You all have had floods. You've had all kinds of tragedies. And you still have a really vibrant and a wonderful fabric here. And that's what I would very much like to write about. So, John Kaiser. John was um, the son of a man named Francis. Um, Francis Marion Kaiser, Uncle Frank, I think is what the family called him, and a woman named Catherine Lane. And Francis and his family had lived here for quite a while. He served in the Missouri Calvary um, during the Civil War. He was captured, came back here, started a family. John had um, two brothers, three sisters. They, they had a hard life. They struggled a lot. You know, they, they were subsistence farmers, more or less, up in Dalton. And from what the family has heard about him, I think that probably made a really significant impression on him very early on, struggling like that. And what I have learned over the course of this is that I feel like he wanted to be respected. I feel like he, he did want to to be kind of a big man in the community. And... The way he went about that was by acquiring land and money through nefarious ways, and that was killing people. And he was taking out large insurance policies. He was taking care of little old ladies who didn't have anyone else to take care of them, and they were very grateful for his attention and his help and his caretaking. And then they turned up dead. But why would anyone really think there was anything wrong with that? You know, it was an older lady who may, might have been sick for a while. But you also don't think that that man, that deputy sheriff, that pillar of the community, is the one that's doing this. He married a little bit later in life. He married a woman named Bertie Surridge. She had been married before as well. She was married to William Brooks. She had divorced him. And... Bertie was a, she was a pretty feisty lady, very pretty. She, uh, she was a suffragette. She was in a suffragette parade right here on the square. There's a great photograph. She was there in her white with her sash and fighting for women's rights and the vote. And she and John married. She had three children, two sons and a daughter. And they were a little bit older, you know, teenage years, mostly grown. But John and Bertie joined for forces. And John became the first county agent here in Randolph County. And it was a new, a, a new development. County agents were a brand new thing. So he was, 
He was on the cusp of technology and innovation. And Bertie was right there with him. She became a home demonstration agent. And while he was helping the farmers with livestock, crop issues, fertilizers, rotation, all the latest techniques, she was there introducing canning techniques and, and all kinds of other new ways to take care of the house and the home and the family. And so they were a great team for many years. And then tragedy struck and Bertie died. And no one necessarily thought too much about it, except for Bertie's daughter, Lorene, who would never speak to John Geyser again. She knew in her heart that there was something not right about what had happened. And I'm going to veer off a little bit from John Geyser. So around this time, over in Jackson County in Swifton, Rosina Bonner and Ludy Arnold got married for the second time. The first time, most likely, had not had the marriage certificate filed. They were married up in Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Ludy Arnold used a bit of an alias. He just put Tom Arnold on this marriage certificate. And this marriage certificate is the only one in the book of marriage licenses that says do not publish. A little weird, huh? Strange. This was in 1917. In 1919, Rosina and Ludie get married again in Swifton. 1919. Except all this time they've been living in Swifton, so why would this happen? This would happen because my grandmother's great uncle was a rounder. He married 16 women in 18 years. <laughs> All over the United States. This is part of the story she failed to tell me. So, Uncle Ludie was a character. She did mention that Uncle Ludie had more than a passing resemblance to Clark Gable, which might explain some of his success with the ladies. Ludy was the son of a very wealthy planner over in Jackson and Lawrence counties. Ludy had his own airplane <coughs> in the teens, late teens. He was flying all over the U.S., spending a little time with the ladies, to getting a marriage license, not filing the marriage license, and then anywhere from two weeks to two months later, disappearing. <laughs> this worked for a while. But eventually, they figured it out. He went on trial for violation of the Mann Act in 1914 down in Fort Worth. U.S. court. Eight women showed up, two with babes in arms. At some point, the testimony, remember we're in 1914, the testimony got a little too explicit. Oh. One of the women testified to Uncle L Ludie's tempestuous lovemaking. This was the quote in the newspaper at the time, believe it or not. And the judge just couldn't handle it anymore. He cleared the courtroom. He said, absolutely not. People do not need to be hearing these things. I am here to uphold the law. So they cleared the court. My great-great-grandfather and his stepmother, who was Uncle Ludie's mother, went to testify in Uncle Ludie's defense that he was insane because he was addicted to <laughs> alcohol and opium. Apparently, this defense did not work because Uncle Ludie was convicted and sentenced to 10 years, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Now, I started doing math and I thought, how in the world could that happen because Bonner was born in 1920 and he married Aunt Rosina in 1919? Well, Uncle Ludie was a smart one, though. He only served two years because he saw the murder of a prison guard and turned state's witness. So he was back on the loose. He returned back here to Arkansas. This part of the story it was all over national and international headlines at the time. Wealthy planter's son has his way with women, whatever. And um, so he came back here, married Aunt Rosina in Poplar Bluff, Missouri in 1917 remarried her in 1919, possibly because 
maybe he'd fallen in love with her at some point during this time, but he hadn't completely uh, reformed himself. And so he and Aunt Rosina lived in Swifton, which is where my grandmother grew up there in Alicia, and um, they had Bonner in 1920. And then the trail goes a little cold. I don't really know what happened after that. I know that uh, Aunt Rosina divorced Uncle Ludie in 1927, and she moved back here to be with her family. She was the only child of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bonner, William Bonner, and Mary Elizabeth Armstrong Bonner. The only child. They were also wealthy farmers themselves. Her father um, owned what was called Bonner's Mill for a while up in an area near called Holmes. Is anyone familiar with Holmes? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. I'm still trying to track that down. I have no idea where that was. Um, he had a store for a while. Um, Rosina went to Wachita um, Maynard Academy as a young girl. She's very pretty, always beautifully dressed, big bow in her dark, dark hair. She was known for her beautiful dark hair. She graduated from Pocahontas High School. Her parents sent her off to finishing school for a bit to St. Catherine's Episcopal Boarding School over in Tennessee. She took lots of trips with her friends to Memphis to go shopping, and she was just the pampered daughter. And she had really bad taste in men. So first she had Uncle Ludy, and then she marries Mr. Kaiser. <coughs> now, Uncle Ludy is still living in Lawrence County at this time. He's in jail. I don't know why. Probably, who knows, probably that the morphine and the alcohol. He's in jail, and he dies in jail. Two weeks after Bertie Kaiser dies. Aww. A little odd. Aww. Mr. Kaiser was also, had been, a chief deputy sheriff. I, I you know, I don't know. It, it does... There are some questions around that about what would have happened because as the story progresses, Mr. Kaiser marries Rosina, Aunt Rosina. She's significantly younger than, she, than he is. She has a little boy who's eight and she dies nine months after they are married. Her father dies about three years later. On July 4th of 1936, her mother dies. And four months after that, four or five months, in November of that year, October, I'm sorry, October of that year, Bonner dies. The question surrounding that is, if Mr. Kaiser was trying to inherit property, etc., he would have never been able to inherit from Bonner if Bonner's father was still alive. He would have never been able to adopt Bonner if Bonner's birth father was still alive. So, I have a few photographs. I'm going to hold these up and then pass them around. So, these photographs, this is a series of photographs. So, this is Bonner, about eight, nine years old. This is John. I'm sure everybody's seen this one before. Right. Okay. And this is Aunt Rosina. And these were taken shortly before their marriage. Okay, so here's Aunt Rosina. Notice anything about Aunt Rosina? She looks sick. Her eyes. Pretty puffy, mm -hmm. puffy face, mm -hmm. deep, deep smudgy circles under her eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this photograph and this photograph accompanied their wedding announcement in 1929. She died nine months after they were married. Anybody think he might have been given her something before they were ever officially Hitched. But but they were living together as having in Swifton as having been married in seventeen. No 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 no. This they was uh no no this this is John. Oh that's John. I've, I've, right. I've, I've jumped right. forward. Sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. I jumped sorry. jumped around a little bit. You're right, sorry. But it does she didn't look like a very healthy woman. Oh, no, 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 not at all. So Aunt Rosina dies. At this point people are a little maybe a little suspicious. 
Birdie, when she died, had had her arm amputated, had all kinds of things happening to her the lead up to her death. Rosina, a little quieter, apparently she and John had gone to Hardy so he could buy some goats. And on the way back, she just started feeling poorly. So he took care of her. But he called one of the doctors to come and gave them, gave this doctor about $300 to come out to the house to see Aunt Rosina. $300 in 1929. That is, has the equivalent buying power of about $15,000 today. And he had called the doctor out when it was pretty fairly obvious that Aunt Rosina was not going to make it. He also took a life insurance policy out on her. And that that took a lot of doing because her family didn't believe in life insurance. Her father used to say that he felt like it was betting on someone's death. Well, he finally wore Aunt Rosina down, but the policy was only made out for $500, except he took another policy out for $35,000. And then she died. So, the state of Arkansas was not entirely pleased with him either. They sued him because he was greedy, but he didn't really follow the rules. He didn't pay the inheritance tax. Didn't do many other things that he should have in that process. And a few months after Aunt Rosina died, he suggested to Mr. and Mrs. Bonner that he should adopt Bonner because, you know, they were older and what would, what would happen to poor Bonner? Except Bonner didn't necessarily need Mr. Kaiser to take care of him. And this was one of the selling points that he had, had raised with Aunt Rosina about this insurance policy, was that, well, someone needs to take care of Bonner. Except Bonner had all the property from his very wealthy, rounder father, right? And he would inherit from his mother. So he really, actually, they didn't really need that $500 policy. But he convinced her. She died. Three years later, Mr. Bonner, who apparently had not been feeling well for a few weeks, has a heart attack in his field. But in the process of all of this, before this heart attack, Mr. Kaiser tried to convince the Bonners to move into town. First of all, he wanted them to trade. They had about 600 acres of very nice farmland here, quite a few acres some other places as well, but he tried to get them to trade the farmland for some town city blocks around here, and Mr. Bonner was not having any of that. He then tried to get them to move into town, into his house, and they didn't really want to do that either. They had a very nice, large house out near the Maynard Road, and uh, he finally convinced them to move into town just for the winter. Possibly to, you know, once they moved in, maybe he could convince them to stay permanently. Well, two days later, their house on the Maynard Road burns oh. up. <laughs> burns up. But he's planned ahead. He is the greatest son-in-law ever. He had taken out insurance on their house just in case. <laughs> and there you go. And in the course of this, I've heard from a number of people that he was... Uh, Suspicions were raised because it seemed like his barns and properties often burned up. So, he adopts Bonner, Mr. Bonner dies, and then in the spring of 1936, Mrs. Bonner dies. And Bonner was very upset. You know, this, was, this woman more or less had taken care of him, you know, since his mother had died. So he's, for the last eight years of his life, this is the only mother he's ever known. And... At this point, people really are thinking this is a little odd. About two weeks before Mrs. Bonner died, he finally wore her down and got her to deed him those 600 acres that he'd been eyeballing for a while. So, Mrs. Bonner dies. And then he really made a strategic error because, you know... People are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. There are all kinds of diseases. People just die. But 16-year-old football players don't just up and die. And 
the town was incredibly upset at this point, right? Um, about a thousand people over at the Methodist Church came for the funeral. They closed all the stores in Perigold for the day. <coughs> Bonner was buried in his uh, letter sweater, which looked very much like this. This is from 1939. He would have been the class of 1938. And um, the minister uh, was off at a bishop's Methodist Bishops Conference. He came back for the funeral, spoke at the funeral, and pleaded with the crowd that people not um, indulge in vigilante justice at this point. I think, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I think this part of the story is fairly familiar. They had taken, um, taken Mr. Kaiser away, didn't tell anybody where they were taking him to begin with, but he eventually ended up in Paragould because sentiments in the town were so high. Um, he had been the deputy sheriff when uh, George Chevre was hauled out of the jail by the townspeople and lynched. So uh, he, was, he was very aware of what might happen. He also was a knight of Pythias. So he was definitely knew the inner workings of the town and of the town's fathers. So he had to have known that the jig was up. So they send Bonner's body off to Little Rock and do the autopsy. And it's very obvious that this was strychnine poisoning. And about this time, uh, Bonner's aunt, great aunt, uh, Sylvia Armstrong Holland, who had grown up here, she was his grandmother's sister, Mrs. Bonner's sister, came in from St. Louis and demanded that, uh, petitioned the court, the court that Mr. Bonner and Mrs. Bonner and Rosina's bodies all be exhumed. Well, Dr. Baltz, Dr. Baltz down here, Dr. Baltz, um, did the exhumation at the behest of the coroner, H.G. <laughs> McNabb, and he exhumed Mrs. Bonner first. And they cut a square out of her abdomen and put it in a box and sent it off to Little Rock. Problem with this, though, was by this time, it had been several months, and decomposition, it was almost impossible for them to determine if she had been poisoned or not. Uh, the results were that it was not an alkaloidal poison, which would have been strychnine or arsenic, but there were enough traces of non-alkaloidal remnants that the uh, professor of chemical physiology felt fairly certain that she had been poisoned, but not enough to be able to enter that into um, evidence. So they never exhumed Aunt Rosina because in the process of this, they have the hearings, have the initial preliminary hearing. The court has to be cleared for a bit because Bonner Arnold's father's family, that would be my family, um, had shown up in court and were understandably upset at everything that had happened. And Mr. Kaiser was in a tizzy about this. He demanded that the Arnold family be removed, that they first be searched for weapons, and that they never be allowed back. Well, the courtroom is cleared. Everybody goes back. They've calmed down. They have searched the Arnolds, who I can testify are actually very nice people. <laughs> and no one had any weapons. But the judge had kind of had enough of what was going on, and there was quite a bit of fighting amongst the uh, attorneys themselves. Prosecuting attorneys, defense attorneys, they almost had more attorneys than they did uh, audience members or, or people from the community who were there in the courtroom. And so they decided to uh, reconvene. They were going to have another hearing. Come back, try and do this again. And so, Mr. Kaiser goes back to jail. In the process of this, as all of this is happening, two prisoners dig out of the jail here because the sheriff, right, was just, you know, justifiably his attention was a little elsewhere. So these two prisoners take, you know, advantage of prime opportunity to dig themselves out of the jail and escape. They were eventually recaptured. That was kind of an interesting part of the story. But Mr. Kaiser is in Paragold, so they're going to move him back over here. And then he stops in Walnut Ridge to get a shave. He gets a Coke. He has the porter buy three Cokes. 
the sheriff and the deputy sheriff decline the Coca-Colas that he has purchased for them. <laughs> and they get back here. And they go to take him out of the car. And he is in rigors. I will pass this around. Everybody can kind of see the photograph of him here. And if you'll flip through to the front page of this, you can see a photograph of, and it's really a spectacular photograph, I have to say. It is a photograph of the state trooper wearing his job purse and his boots with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, carrying in Mr. Kaiser into Dr. Balta's clinic, you know, while he's basically in rigor. So it's a really delightful period photograph, so make sure that you take a look at that. And uh, so he committed suicide, and they sent his his body for chemical analysis to Little Rock. They determined that yes, it was strychnine poisoning, but no one knows how he got it. I mean, in theory, you would think this man has poisoned a bunch of people. Would you probably search him to make sure he did not have that? But it could have been secreted on his person. It could have been, you know, in the lining of his jacket. There are, you know, many different theories. Um, several months later, in December, Pocahontas Star Herald had a follow-up article that said that back in Paragould, they'd found a small vial on top of the prisoner's cage um, where they would have kept him, so they seemed to think that he had it with him at the time. Who, who really knows? Um, but that was kind of the end of that. And um, he had asked to be buried next to Rosina, between Rosina and Bonner, in the Bonner in the Armstrong plot out at Masonic Cemetery. Saner heads prevailed. He was not buried there. He also left a handwritten note, um, Will, that was dated at 5 a.m. in Paragool, in which he left all this various property to his brothers and sisters after, uh, after all of his uh, debts had been paid. And then he left, also in this, left to Minnie Brown, which I believe was his sister, um, uh, his sister Re Rebecca. He left her his Ford car and all of his household goods and supposedly a cow. I don't know if this was a special cow or <laughs> just a cow. Um, but he wrote several different letters. So he wrote one letter denouncing football. Football was the cause of Bonner's death. He did not do this. Football was a scourge. And that, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens. Well, the superintendent of schools here wrote another letter back, which was published in the newspaper, in which he adamantly opposed everything that Mr. Kaiser had said and said, in fact not, you murdered your adopted son, but also young men all over this country play football day in, day out. They practice, they play games. This is not what happened. But I thought that was very interesting too, that the superintendent of schools here made a very specific um, um, argument against that. Mr. Kaiser also, a couple of other things, <laughs> denounced the Arnold family again and declared that Aunt Rosina's body should not be exhumed, but if it was, that they should go and see that the $500 pearl necklace he had given her and the ruby brooch and all this, the Arnolds had stolen it. And that they should make sure that it was still in there. Well, she hadn't been buried with anything at all, and the Arnolds would not have had any capability. They were the, the family of her ex-husband, who was since deceased. Um, Aunt Sylvia, Bonner's great aunt, uh, who had asked for the exhumation of these bodies, sued Mr. Kaiser's estate for $60,000 um, for pain and suffering. And that case actually lagged for a while, but it actually set a precedent, um, which is still used in courts now, that have to do with adoptive parental rights. And um, the last thing... Uh, that Mr. Kaiser had mentioned, and he, he seemed to be a very prolific 
letter writer while he was in jail, um, was that he had $3,400 buried in a hole at his house. Well, they get over to the house, and there's a hole, and there's nothing in it. So, that's about all I have for y'all now. Um, I have some, I've blown up a few of the um, headlines from the time, so young, here we go, young Kaiser's death, not due to football. <laughs> Besides the fact that he had quite a large abscess below his elbow here, where Dr. Kaiser had been injecting him. Um, oh, and Dr. Kaiser's favored, um, favored excuse for people dying was malaria. He was treating everyone for malaria. Well, there had been no outbreaks of malaria here for 50 years prior or 50 years post. So, you know. Anyway, this, is, this was Bonner. So this is another photograph of him, and this says, No violence pleats divine at funerals. So this was, the, this was Reverend Williford who uh, conducted the uh, funeral service. There's old John again. So Kaiser accused poisoner takes drug and dies, ends life before hearing starts. So um, anyway, that's it. If anybody has any questions, um, comments, stories, I would love to hear them. This is an ongoing, an ongoing investigation. So um, I'm, happy, I'm happy to answer anything. I'm happy to share anything. I would love to hear your stories. If you feel like you have a lead or something that I haven't tracked down or somebody you think I should talk to or a direction you think I should go in, I would love to do that as well. Oh, and I have one last thing. So I gave everybody a little poison vial. If you can get your piece of paper out, you should be, most of you should be able to. There should be some numbers one through four. If you're one, two, three, or four, you win a prize. Do we have any? Oh, you're prize number one. Bingo. All right. All right. Gail Torek wins. The gift certificate to yeah, Rocky's soap store. Well, oh, I'm looking for some. Questions? Anyone have any questions for me? Let me oh. see if this. Will... Oh, no. I'm sure you don't know. But if the poison vial was thrown in a prison cell, would you use it? Can I your borrow your poison? Tweezers! Isn't that a wonderful question? That's exactly what I have. I thought that was very strange, too. What in the world would he have? How would he have taken it? How would he have transported it? If that that was, I mean, it kind of beggars belief. I, none of which makes any sense. Anyone? Anyone else? Have you been out to see his actual grave? I have. Oh, that is something that I forgot to mention. Um, so there are there are some theories that perhaps he is not buried out at Reynolds. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have been out there. The headstone is quite new. It was put there in the 70s at some point. No one knows who put the headstone there. Um, no family members. And there's no dates on it. There are dates, actually. There are dates. Not on the headstone. This guy's got something. Says, oh, what number are you, sir? Three. Number two. All right. And Mary Ann's on the three. three. <laughs> okay. So you win tiramisu at Bella Piazza. Yay. Can you read this? Dessert. 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 Oh, no, there's nothing on that one, I don't think. Actually, does it say anything? Mary, Mary Ann. Mary Ann. Okay. You get skull and crossbones soap from Pocahontas. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Because he killed himself, they just dropped the case. They never tried yep. to. Mm -hmm. Didn't do. That was it. That he uh, was actually a killer. Correct. Because there wasn't. I mean, there was no one to try, and you can't. Yeah, try a dead person. So, but so it was just, that was that it. Was it. Um, a couple other things that I didn't mention. Um, supposedly, but the, but the strychnine came back on Bonner. Yeah, well, he was. I mean, he was indicted because the strychnine came back on Bonner. Uh -huh. But they felt like you know that was the end of it. There wasn't 
legally you can't do kept, anything else. Kaiser kept claiming it was football injury. Correct. Correct. And, and he but they didn't that find. He by accident. Right. He also so he also said this. He said that um, Bonner took it by accident and that it was sitting on the shelf next to quinine. That. And you take quinine is for malaria. <laughs> right. But you know, knowing of course that strychnine is very, very bad for you. Why would you keep it on the shelf next to quinine? But the other part was that they found quite a few bottles, uh, empty strychnine bottles that were in the stove, you know, stove or fireplace. So, eh. So did any of these insurance companies go after these assets since they had paid out policies? I am still kind of trying to track this down because <laughs> there are a lot of documents that... Um, Linda Bolin has very graciously uh, said that at some point she would help me perhaps go through and try and track where all these assets went because this man supposedly was extremely wealthy, um, believed to be one of the wealthiest men in this county and had nothing to show for it at the end of his life. So, um, you know, where did the $35,000 go? Um, he had lots of schemes um, apparently, he did not seem to be a particularly successful businessman, um, but he was very a successful serial killer until he wasn't. Um, at the time, the sheriff um, had planned to send him, and I don't know if this actually ever happened, had planned to send him to Little Rock to be questioned by the chief of police there because he had so many friends in this area. He knew many, many state officials, many local officials. He was very good friends with Governor Terrell, um, and Governor Terrell had helped um, um, facilitate uh, a business disagreement that he had had with someone in Missouri and actually broke off um, some relations that Arkansas and Missouri had had with each other and um, uh, some reciprocal relationships because um, because of what had happened to Mr. Kaiser, because Mr. Kaiser hadn't been treated very well, the governor of Arkansas said, well, I'm, you know, whatever projects they were working on with Missouri, they shelved. So he had apparently quite a bit of influence and had friends with quite a bit of influence. But back to the, oh. Have you ever heard of John Kaiser going out to the country shooting dogs? He, he didn't like dogs. Yes, yes, I have, I have read that, that he, uh, Really? Yeah. Who, Bowers Street. who was your mom? Uh, Agnes Kincaid. Okay. okay. And a neighbor. She was a neighbor then. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. She was, that's the street wow. you lived on. Okay. Well, she, wasn't, she wasn't Kincaid then. She was oh. Shackle. She was She was shackled. No, then. she married though, I think. Was she married then? Okay. Dad, yeah. They were okay. married in 29. Was that was the name of that street Kaiser Street, and they changed it to Bowers? Uh, oh, the Kaiser, I think. Yes. Uh, I think it still, I think it goes down uh, a little bit further out, and it goes down around the uh, nursing home. And okay. It picks up picks up Kaiser at the nursing home, mm -hmm. goes around. He's done okay. work. That makes yeah, sense. Had Kaiser, all that land. Uh -huh. the Kaiser Field yeah. instead of Balls Field. Right. 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 Um, has anybody ever seen any coins or tokens that had Mr. Kaiser's? Name on them? No. Hmm. Okay. Have you found some? Uh, there was one online that somebody from this town was selling, and I didn't realize um, that it was being sold. That auction had already ended, but no one purchased it. Was uh, it was name? being sold on eBay. Uh, what was the name? Mock. Something. Mock. Oh, Richard Mock. Does oh, anyone yeah, know Richard, Richard Mock? Mock? Well, I think he lives up at Biggers. Biggers, yeah. Oh, okay. That's okay. Oh, well, he's selling sure. it. Sure, he's related to Joanna, I bet. You know that Kaiser's half brother inherited his estate. His estate. Oh yes, the the th Bonner. Bonner's half brother. Bonner, Bonner. Those were three half brothers. One of them. Um, one of them. Uh, his name was changed to Gene Peterson. His mother married a, a man named Peterson after Uncle Ludy ran off, and she was from Walla Walla, Washington, and um, so Gene. Ludy Jr., well, that was his original name. Um, Gene was living in Iowa, and then there were two other half-brothers, uh, Tom and a Max Ewing, um, who, but again, 
there didn't doesn't seem to that's something I'm tracking down now. There doesn't seem to have been much of an estate to inherit at that point. So, um, do you know whether there was? What do you know whether there was or much of a state? I don't know. I just have the papers that show that he was court ordered that he inherit. So. They didn't say what. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure how they would have even known where these half-brothers were or how the half-brothers knew that he had been killed because they were living very distantly. And from what I understand, there was, I mean, not any... Ludi's, Correct. Ludi's ex-wife before Rosina sued to inherit, or her son to inherit. Right. No, I know that. Right. Lydia, well, she wasn't really his ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> Legally, um, but uh, I, I, but I still don't. I don't know how she knew that Bonner was dead because it was all over the place. It was, it was in a Little Rock newspaper, right? But she wasn't living here. She was living in Iowa. Oh, okay. So um, it was all over inter state, uh, national, and international papers. But you know, it was check 1936. Well, check, so I'm not check the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Because if it was in that, I bet that went to Iowa. It was, it okay, went, that makes it sense. Went, it went here. You know, it was here. Was um, back to the gravestone. Um, it says, in memory of, which um, several of us find odd, generally speaking, a headstone, you don't need it to say in memory of because it's signifying that somebody is there. Yes. When you have something that says in memory, that's a memorial because you either don't have a body or you don't know where the body is. Um, also, it says first county agent. So whoever has put this out there is, I mean, you could have just put his name, right? Whoever put it out there is still trying to redeem him, I think. He's also not in the Kaiser plot, which is quite large, and there's still quite a bit of room. He is next to the Kaiser plot, but he is also next to a cousin that he supposedly murdered, a woman named Sarah Stubblefield. Um, and the other kind of insult added to injury, he is, this uh, headstone is next to her, but her headstone has her information on it, and it says, given courtesy of John Kaiser. So, oh, wow. yes, yes, yes. So. When my mother went out there and saw that, she said, I'll say in courtesy of John Kaiser, he killed her. Right, right. So there are thoughts that um, he was possibly buried in Stubblefield and that two graves were dug. So um, H.G. Uh, McNabb took him, H.G. and his son Clifford took um, Mr. Kaiser's body out in the middle of the night. Um, there was, people were very upset still and um, they were trying to get him out as quickly as possible. They were very concerned that people would, you know, I don't know, break into the funeral home or do something. I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, they dug apparently two graves, and no one knows where he is buried. Actually, uh, Linda and I <laughs> went out to uh, went out to Reynolds when I was here three weeks ago, and we stopped at uh, the Dalton store mm -hmm. and had delicious sandwiches. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been, go. Best sandwiches in the world. But Linda ran into someone that she uh, knew when she lived out in the country, a farmer out there. And she, I was getting my sandwich, and she um, asked him if he knew anything about John Kaiser. And, yeah. Eventually, she, he continued, and he said, well, you know, some people think he's buried in Reynolds. And some people think he's buried in Stubblefield. And some people say that McNabb took him up to Corning and just let him loose. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, there's, there's more people than, than you would imagine who believe that Kaiser was buried in Reynolds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's more people than than you would imagine who believe that. And and one woman swears that her cousin in California saw him. Oh. <laughs> yes. Oh, so God. apparently, Mr. Kaiser and Elvis are in California, guys. Kathleen <laughs> Thrush. Kathleen Thrush swears that her cousin in California saw John Kaiser oh. out there. They don't believe he did. They don't believe he died. Oh. Uh -huh. No, he's not. No, he's not. You're right, Bill. Sure, please do. And I guess I'm the only person here that remembers the actual John Kaiser, but I do remember him very well. I was uh, about 
oh, around five and six years old at this time. That was when Bonner uh, died. I was six years old. And but we we were neighbors and we were together a lot. And the and this Sarah Stubblefield that Lauren was telling you about, I can tell you exactly where her little house was. She was our neighbor too. And everyone called her Aunt Sari because back in those days, Sarah would usually come out Sari. And uh, where the uh, de clerk, I think, no, the Stimel, excuse me, the Stimel Insurance Agency is there next to Taco Casa. Yeah. Right in that area right there, there was a little story and a half, little, as I remember it, like a little Victorian house sat there, and that was Aunt Sari's house. And I do know that Mr. Kaiser visited her all the time and took care of her, and she bragged about John all the time. And I remember the Kaisers. Uh, I remember very well uh, my brother playing over in the Kaiser yard because when he married Rosina and moved uh, moved she and Bonner into the, the home right across from the old nursing home over here, the old hospital, uh, he had everything there for the and all the boys in the neighborhood, my brother included, would play in that yard all the time. And they had ping pong on the front porch and they had basketball and all of that. And I remember Bonner very well. Uh, I sprained my ankle over there one day playing and Bonner carried me home. And then Bonner and uh, uh, Star Randall, if any of you remember Becky, well, she, Becky Jansen's father, uh, took my mother and I to Rector, and uh, Bonner drove us over there to visit my aunt. So I, re I do remember Mr. Kaiser, and I'm probably the only one here that knew John Kaiser. And it's Billy Carroll, my dear little friend Billy, loves to tell everybody. She's old enough to remember John Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I'm telling my age when I tell this, but anyway. I do remember him, and I thought that might be of interest. Mr. Kaiser also, when uh, when his first wife died, he uh, got my mother to wash and iron his white shirts because he before he married Rosina, because he didn't know how to, or and he always wore white shirts. But when he brought the laundry every week. Uh, he would tell my brother and sister and I to be sure and look in his shirt pockets. And we, we would find a sucker or, or a, three suckers or three sticks of gum or three pieces of candy. So needless to say, we dearly love John Kaiser for that reason. So, And if you ever attend the Haunted Tour, uh, you might hear me tell quite a bit more about Mr. Kaiser and... Uh, uh, some of the things that that I knew of, and and I think the reason probably that I remember him at such a young age, really, uh, five and six years old, is because he would make such an impression on on us. You know, it thrilled us so much when he would come, and we we just really enjoyed going through those shirt pockets to see, <laughs> yeah. and sometimes nickels, and yeah. which a nickel. In those days, I mean, we could go to Joe Pete and just stock up on candy. <laughs> so anyway, I just thought you might find it interesting. And my mother and father were sitting in the living room at John Kaiser's home the night that the sheriff came and arrested him uh, when Bonner died. Bonner had died that day. And when they came to, to arrest him, the neighbor, all of the neighbors, including my mother and father, were there. So. I have a question, Virginia. Uh, I heard someone today say that he was pretty much uh, silver tongue, slick talker. Well, I imagine, uh, yes, he was a very personable person. Yes, and we all just loved him, you know, and uh, no one ever convinced my grandmother that he ever killed anyone. She thought he was just wonderful. So, anyway, I just thought I'd add that. Thank you, Mrs. Stevens. We appreciate that. Um, so I have a couple things. I am actively seeking uh, annuals. If anybody has something up in the attic somewhere, I am looking for an annual from 
1936, 1935, um, any kind of photographs from, you know, basically 1900s through about 1936. So um, if you've got any of those and you think they might be helpful, um, I would love to talk to you. Um, I didn't bring cards. Shoot. My phone number, if anybody would like to write this down, is 713-249-4952. And my email address is duchess, D-U-C-H-E-S-S, -S of O-F, Lala, L-A-L-A, -L -A, no spaces, at gmail.com. Yes, ma'am. Have you checked at the uh, library to see what they have? I have. I have. I have. I know they have some. But right. I Unfortunately, don't they don't have any. They don't have any annuals. I don't know. There's just a gap. No, they don't. They don't. Unfortunately. But I have been through. There was a nice Kaiser file. There apparently is an original article that came out that I think um, they died like dogs was roughly based on loosely based on, I should say. They came out in 1938, so two years after the uh, after the murder, the final murder, I should say. Um, if you haven't read it, pop over to the library. It's quite interesting. It's quite a bit longer than They Died Like Dogs. It's much more um, factually correct. Um, that was super helpful as well. Um, so, yeah, I have back and forth to the State Archives as well. I'm going to head over to Paragold do a little bit more but again I am completely open to any suggestions or any stories or anything that anybody has so thank you all so much I really appreciate it